Hi, I'm John Davidson, lead pastor at Evangel Temple. Thank you so much for tuning into the message today. I hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you. If it is, leave us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoy this message from God's Word today. We often hear about how great life is and how thankful we should be. Stories of miracles, successes, and it's true. All of that exists. Our life story is full of God's goodness. Moments when God showed up and we experience the unexpected solutions. But moments we experience before the miracle, before the success, it's in the midst of the unknown and the pain. Those are the moments we don't hear enough about. It's the moments we don't talk enough about. And it's in these moments that we don't always reach out and consistently check in with those around us. I've said for years that everyone enjoys the moments of success, but they don't always enjoy the stories behind the success. It's in those moments that we wander in the wilderness and experience the middle of the story. However, in the middle, that's where we experience some of our greatest moments with God, where we're the most vulnerable and where God gently molds our hearts. It's where the foundations of our beliefs become strong and we find that God can be trusted. If you'll turn with me to the book of Job, let's dive into his story and get to know a little bit more about him. Job 1 tells us that he was an honest man inside and out, a man of his word and totally devoted to God. He hated evil with a passion. He was blameless, not sinless, but he was blameless, and a man of integrity. And it lists out all of the animals he owned and the number of servants. This indicates that he was a man of great wealth and power. His life appears to be amazing. But it doesn't take long, literally two paragraphs, before the story takes a twist. And in Job 1, 13 through 19, there are four accounts of crisis one immediately following the other. Now, Job starts his day like any other day. And all of a sudden, a messenger comes and tells of someone stealing and killing his oxen and donkeys. And then another messenger comes, telling of lightning striking the sheep and the shepherds and killing them. A third messenger comes and describes an absolute massacre of camels and the servants with them. The final report describes a tornado destroying his son's home and killing his kids. Every account starting with, while he was still talking, and it ends with, I'm the only one to get out alive and tell you what happened. The explanation of one crisis doesn't even end before the next crisis is being presented to him. How incredibly overwhelming. Shortly after that, Job's entire body breaks out with incredibly painful sores. Job 1.22 tells us that Job continued to not sin, and he did not blame God. He made a choice on how to respond. And I love how we get to walk through Job's story. It takes time to describe in detail what he experienced in the conversations he had in the middle of his story. Job's story is full of pain and suffering. But the book of Job allows us to see the end of the story. And I just want to pause and take a moment. If you're in the midst of suffering, if you can't see options, if you can't find hope and you can't see God in your situation, let this be the story, let this be the hope that God is here and you are seen. Just like Job Sometimes our suffering isn't because of anything we did. Sometimes we experience simply, suffering simply because of the brokenness of the world we live in. What I find interesting is what happened before the moments, right before the crisis. God actually uh, is sitting there in the throne room and points out Satan who has arrived with a group of angels ready to report to God. And God asks him, what have you been up to? And then he asks, have you noticed my friend Job? God and Satan seem to then have a short interaction discussing how Job, being a fierce lover of God, would respond if everything was taken away from him. There's a question of, would he still love God as much 
when all of the comforts of his life were removed. So God allows Satan to do what he wants to Job with any of his possessions, but not to physically hurt him. So Job is sitting there living his incredible life, and then crisis hits. Satan comes, and he steals his family and attacks his fortune. And then we're back in the conversation with God and Satan, and God points out how Job had stayed true and honest and totally devoted to God, full of integrity. And Satan asks a question. What is Job's ability to stay faithful if his health is attacked? And God answers, go ahead. You can do whatever you like with him, but don't kill him. When I first heard that story, I felt extremely vulnerable. Was God not actually a good father? Does he not care about me? Will he not protect me? At any moment, no matter how much I try to do good, God can just send crisis for me to survive? Even though this story may portray God in a negative way, we have to realize that our human perspective is limited, and we cannot base our view of God on only a section of the story. Stories in the Bible are sometimes confusing and difficult for me to process, especially when they're heavily poetic like Job. I have to battle to choose and accept the fact that God is good, even when I'm confused or struggling to understand. And if you're struggling to believe that God is good, I'd like to tell you that it's okay to walk the messy journey of finding Jesus and his love for you. Now, we often go to the Bible for answers. The why is so important. I feel like I can endure about anything as long as I understand why it's happening. However, the book of Job is an invitation to trust God's wisdom Unfortunately, it's not an explanation of why God allows us to experience the pain. This week, I challenge you to take some time to slowly read through Job's story, to sit with the words being spoken to him, to feel the grief, the physical pain. Can you relate to his suffering? The moments when suffering arrives unexpectedly and steals our joy, control, our possessions and relationships. Now, after Job's crisis, we see a dialogue between Job and his wife, and Job's wife famously says, curse God and die. Job's response is true, and I find it remarkable that he can speak it with such honesty, but it can sometimes be difficult to live out. Job says, should we accept only the good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? It's a short interaction, but it's a powerful perspective. Job then continues encountering long back-and-forth arguments with his three friends, and it takes up most of the book of Job, literally chapters 3 through 28, and it walks us through these really raw moments. Job's friends have a negative reputation, and for good reason. Ultimately, they argued and they tried to fix the situation according to their own perspectives and beliefs. However, they did do a few things well. They came to him, and they didn't leave. They were there for seven days without speaking and offering advice. They showed up. They sat with Job. They were a physical reminder that Job was not alone. Now, Job looked like he had a great life and he had it all together. But in a moment, his life changed. When we live life authentically with each other, we don't always have to look like we're good. When you're checking in with someone in your life, don't just ask how they are and move on. Take some time, look in their eyes. Really check in with them. Honesty of how someone is doing sometimes unfolds when you create a pause and you ask just one more time, how are you really? It's the emotional connection people are looking for as they seek safe people to share their pain with as they risk being vulnerable. Another thing that we can learn from Job's friends is when someone takes the risk and they speak vulnerably, be careful how you speak. Our words are powerful. Proverbs 18.21 says that our words can bring death or life. What's your response to those who are suffering? Does it build their strength for their journey? Or does it cause them to doubt the love of their father Your words matter. 
It's in these conversations with his friends that we experience Job walking through the middle of his story. Being in the middle is when you're equal distance from where you've come from and where you're going. You're no closer to the way things used to be than to the new destination that God has set before you. It's the most vulnerable space. It's in the middle when the greatest cries of honesty meet the ears of God. The middle is often when the storm hits, and it appears you have limited options for survival. In the middle, when we ask some of the deepest questions from the places of desperation, how much longer do I have to endure this? Will it ever end? Will it ever feel better? It's the moment you realize another day holds the same pain, the same grief, the same fear. Being in the middle can be terrifying. It's full of unknowns, and there's no shortcut. You have to make choices to endure the pain and keep moving forward and trusting God, or to go back to the place of perceived comfort, even though it's outside the will of God. Job describes what it's like being in the middle without the support of those around him in chapter 30. And now my life drains out as suffering seizes and grips me hard. The pain never lets up. I'm a muddy mess inside and out. I shout for help, God, and nothing, no answer. I stand to you face, you protest, and you give me a blank stare. You raised me up so I was riding high, and then you dropped me and I crashed. What did I do to deserve this? I looked for light, but darkness fell. Each day confronts me with more suffering. Have you ever felt like that? Has your heart ever longed to speak those words? Not just to God, but to wrestle with this raw vulnerability in a safe place with a safe friend who can hear you and just be with you in your pain. How are you creating space in your life to allow people to have time to speak vulnerably? It requires trust, and trust takes time. It's why community is so important. Who are you surrounding yourself with in order to build deep, trusted relationships so that you can create safe places to be honest and vulnerable? Now, in chapter 31, Job continues his prayer stating all of the good things that he's done, his integrity, his kindness for people. In a sense, he's presenting a case to God of how good acts and how he seems to be very confused at why he's experiencing such deep, unjust suffering. Being in the middle can hurt. But what I love about Job is that we see honest wrestling with God. Through these chapters of conversations, arguments, and prayers, we gather truths that we can be honest with God, that God can handle our emotions, all of them, our fear, confusion, anger. God is not scared of our emotion. We don't always have to behave. We don't always have to come gently to God in our prayers. We do not have to minimize our pain with God. Job 6, 8 through 13 gives us insight into the raw honesty of Job as he is pressed beyond his limits. He begs for answers, wondering where his strength will come from, and he's questioning if he can even endure the suffering. Job 10 continues with Job describing his agony. He literally says, I hate my life, and his honesty about the bitterness that's growing inside his soul. He's angry at his situation. He's angry with God. What I love is that God invites us into the conversation. We see examples of this when Jesus invites the disciples to come in close, to sit and to debate with him. It was culturally expected to dialogue, and that's where you find answers. When you wrestle in the middle of your circumstances, know that you can be honest with God as you learn to trust him. But my question for all of us is, do we trust God enough to allow him into the darkest spaces of our life? Do we take time to actually sit with God and process our feelings? Luke 5, 16 tells us that Jesus took time to talk with God. He paused his life and he escaped the quiet places. He had to escape the noise of life. 
because Jesus deeply understood the excruciating pain of living in humanity and that God's presence in his life was the only way he'd survive. We see that in Isaiah 53, 3 and Matthew 26, 39. Jesus is familiar with agony. And he even understands the moments when the answer for, is for suffering to continue in spite of desperate prayers to remove it. In the moments when we don't experience answers or hear from God like we expect or hope for, in the moments when God seems silent and our pain continues, we might struggle to trust God. We watch others experience miracles and answered prayers. And yet our own honest prayers for our own healing and our miracles seem to go unanswered. Doubt floods our mind. Comparison rises in our hearts. We grieve the loss of unfulfilled expectations. But just because God is verbally silent does not mean that he's not present. Although it may not be in a way that you expect or hope for. Job was honest about his pain. But he held on to a deep-rooted truth. That God is good even when we can't see or experience what we, experience, what we expected from God's response or relief from the situation. Again, we see this example of Jesus walking through this in Mark 14, 36. Jesus, in his humanity, asked God, take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Three things that we can learn from Jesus' prayer. Because Jesus walked through suffering, we can trust him to walk with us through our suffering. Jesus did not focus on his desire to change the circumstances, but he focused on trusting God, and he released his circumstances to God, even though he didn't understand. When our stories have unexpected plot twists, and we don't see what's coming, God's plan is still what we should seek and chase after. If you find yourself saying, it's not supposed to be this way, Lisa Turker's Seeing Beautiful Again is a great devotional. Let it be a resource as you focus on trusting God in the midst of your pain. Now, God does not promise that we won't suffer, but he does promise that he is with us if we will allow him to wrap his presence around us. And when we do that, we find safety and rest. God is extending peace and hope to us. And all we have to do is choose to reach out and hold on to it and let it anchor us. God's promise, God promises us that he is with us. He loves you. He loves all of you. Every emotion, every honest conversation with him. In Isaiah 43, 1 through 4, it says, I have called your name. You are mine. I will be there with you. You are precious in my eyes and honored. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. We have hope. However, it requires us to trust God and release control. But don't wait until you experience trials to build your trust in God. The foundation of trust is built in everyday life. Building relationship with him. As you read his word, you're spending consistent time in his presence and capturing moments that show his deep love for you in practical ways. It's in the suffering that our trust is tested. It's when we lean on our trust that we remember the past and all that God has done for us. It's in the suffering when our trust is solidified because of the friction we've endured to survive. When we trust we can watch God's perfect plan play out, and we can see beyond our limited understanding. Job's story ends with God's answer. Job 38 through 40 walks us through God's reminder of who's in control, and it's not Job. I think sometimes we hear God's voice as harsh and condemning. I think God does have a directness to his tone, but I do not hear him shaming Job. God honors his wrestling, his struggling, and his honesty. Job is stuck in his head and is weary of the suffering, and it takes God's directness to capture his attention and reset his focus. 
And just as God allowed Job to speak honestly, God speaks honestly to Job. God reminds him that the world is far more com complicated than he realizes. And statements like, where were you when I created everything, and referencing Job's lack of perspective and limited power shows God's love since creation. It's proof that we can find comfort in God's plan and trust him. God's answer to Job is a clear statement that his grace is sufficient. God lo Job lost everything, his emotional health, his physical health, a marriage full of tension, broken friendships, death of loved ones. God wants us to see that we have hope when we walk through suffering, that he's with us, that he wins. This is part of living in a sin-filled world. This is humanity. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11 says, Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and will like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not only the ones, you're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. This is the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on faith. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal and glorious plans, will have you put together on, on your feet for good. He gets the last word. It's in the middle of our stories where our testimonies become strong. Now, as I've walked through life, there have been so many precious moments when God's voice was loud and I was confident that he was close to my side. But there have been so many moments when I have found myself in the darkness of pain and I felt lost. It's in the midst of difficult circumstances that I wasn't sure what the outcome would be when all I knew was that I was determined to survive. It's in the moments when I find that the obedient yes that God has handed to me all but crushes me. It's sitting with friends as they fight health battles beyond their control. Or in the middle of prayers, crying out to God, searching for his voice that will provide a clear answer instead of continuing to walk in the unknowns. In these moments, when you find yourself experiencing the pain that you didn't expect, that you don't have control over, and if you're weary and the agony is becoming unbearable, I want to be the voice that reminds you of the hope you will find when you pause and refocus on God and his promises, precious memories that he's given you to confirm that he is with you. I want to shout the battle cry with you as you wrestle through circumstances that aren't working out like you had hoped for. Don't, don't give up. Don't stop praying. Keep believing. You are a survivor, and you're not alone. Don't focus on your way of getting to the other side of your circumstances. But in every circumstance, beyond the spiraling emotions, the doubts, the hopelessness, the lack of options, make the decision that you can trust God and then hold on tight to these main concepts. Perspective is key to trusting God. I am safe in your hands and in your plans. God is good. And say it with me. God is good to me. We may not know why we suffer, but we can take our honest pain, our grief, and our fear to God and trust that in all of his wisdom, he will love us enough to walk with us through every circumstance. Thanks again for watching the service today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear from you, so if you'd like to leave a note in the comments and let us know what you thought about the message, we'd love that. And if you're ever in the Springfield, Missouri area on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you join us for church. You can attend our 8 a.m. classic service, or you can join us for church at 9.30 or 11.